Hey, welcome to Church Experience. Thank you so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Now's a great time to grab your pens and weeklies and head to your seats if you haven't already, because the service starts in 90 seconds.
Welcome Church Experience family. It is so good to see you West Chase, CE Cape Coral. I also wanna give a shout out to CE Butler, Jacksonville, North Carolina. We love those of you in Dunedin or if you join us online too. Lastly, welcome to our upcoming locations in Venice, Daytona Beach, Ridge Manor. It is so good to spend time with our Church Experience family. We're so thankful that you chose to spend your weekend here with us at CE. We believe that this could be the most impacting hour of your week. Today we get to start our brand new Relate teaching series. In fact, next week we have something special for all of you. We'll be handing out a three week Relate devotional written by some of your very own CE leaders. So join us next week. We're gonna have a copy waiting just for you. One of the things we are super passionate about at Church Experience is investing in the next generation. And I'm excited to announce that next week, the adventure series starts in Kid Experience. Kids will enjoy filling up their adventure books with their badges, pictures with special characters, also trading and collecting pins. It's gonna be an unforgettable adventure. Ultimately, we love how this gets the next generation excited to come to Church Experience to learn more about God, grow in their faith, learn the stories of the Bible, memorize God's word, to sing and dance to some life-changing songs at their level. We can't wait to see all the life change that happens in the adventure series. So tell your friends and family about it. They're not gonna regret coming. Before we dive into the rest of our service, I just wanna welcome any VIPs, our first time guests. You're very important to God and you're very important to us. We would love to get to know you. Please go ahead and pull out your phone and scan the QR code on the screen so we can get connected with you. Or you can fill out the response card on the bottom of your weekly and tear it off and drop in the offering bucket later when it passes in the service. All right, let's jump into our Relate teaching series. you anywhere 
holy that's who you are angels and earth sing a song for your honor this power belongs to you the power belongs to you i can never grow tired of telling you you're worthy there's so many ways i could sing of your glory no i will never get tired of telling you you're worthy over and over again always now and forever you're matchless clothed in the colors of heaven and no eye has ever thank you for all you are, all you've done and all you're doing in each and every one of our lives, Lord. There are no words that we could sing to even match all you are, Lord. But we will sing over and over and over again because you're worthy of every praise, God. We love you and we thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
<laughs> we are in a new series this week. So last week, Pastor Nathan was here. I don't know if you guys got a chance to be here last week for Pastor Nathan. He's my pastor from down in Tennessee, Clarksville, Tennessee. He came up here to bless us with the word. It was an amazing time. Uh, but it was an intro going into our new series called Relate. And so what Relate is all, we all, we all want to know what it, what it takes to win when it comes to relationships, right? Like how many of us have relationships in our lives and like we, we, we've had problems, but we want to see success in our relationships, right? Like we want to have success in relationships, whether it's personal relationships with, with family, with, with your spouse, with your friends, colleagues at work, like and wherever there is a relationship, we want to have success. And, and what, this whole, what this whole series is going to be surrounded on is we, are, we have to start living, we have to start living like Jesus in our relationships in order to have success in our relationships. We have to order, in order for us to have healthy, rich, full, abundant relationships, full of life, we have to start applying some of the characteristics, some of the lifestyle of Jesus into our personal relationships and how we live with one another, how we love with one another, how we forgive one another, how we communicate with one another. These are all things that we need to be looking at in our relationships. And so over the next four weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to cover some areas in our lives that are preventing us from living like Jesus and having a fruitful and meaningful relationships. See, God, God desires us to have community. Like, he desires for us to have community. We see it all throughout the Bible. He wants us to live together. He doesn't want us to live alone. You see, in, in Genesis 2, it says it's not good that man should be alone, right? Hebrews 10 says, let us, cons let us consider how to stir one another up. Let's stir one another up. Like these are, these are signs that, that God wants us to have deep, meaningful relationships. It continues on. First Peter says, above all, keeping love with one another earnestly. And in Galatians 6, it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so these are all signs that God truly desires for you not to live alone, to be in relationships. And that's what we really want to have in our lives. See, God clearly values relationships. And if God values it, guess what? We should probably value it too. And I know what you're thinking. Sometimes it's like, you know what? It's not worth the trouble of trying to be in a relationship, rekindle a relationship, mend broken relationships. But let me tell you, the, the sign of a true repentant heart is a, is a, is a heart that seats reconciliation. Reconciliation. Like a, a heart that's truly after God is a heart that seeks to reconcile. I mean, honestly, that's why Jesus, that's why God sent Jesus here is to reconcile us back to the Father, right? And so if we want to take on that characteristic of Jesus, then our heart needs to be reconciliation. We need to look at and value relationships. You see, because God, he wanted to have a relationship with us. That's why he sent his son to die for us. He wanted to be back in communion with us. He also desires us to have relationships with each other. Each other. That's why Jesus' great commission was go make disciples of all nations. You can't make a disciple without having a relationship. You have to have relationships. But sometimes there are barriers that prevent us from having these rich, authentic relationships. Not only with others, but also with God. And there's, there's some barriers in our lives that... That, that, that might make us uh, feel distant away from God or might prevent us from hearing clearly from God. There's some things in our lives that hinder us from seeing and feeling God in our lives, right? Like there's something that happens in our lives sometimes where we're like, God, I know you're there, but I don't really see you. I don't really feel you. I can't feel your presence. God, there's, there's something happening. Like God, I can hear you, but you're faint away and I can't really make out what you're saying. It's like, it's like, I'm going to paint the picture for you here. Is, have, you guys have, you have, we all have cell phones. We've been on cell phones, yeah? I'm a participation pastor. I mean, we, we've been on cell phones, right? Like, all right, cool. Some of y'all on them right now. That's why you hear my question. <laughs> Mom? <laughs> Kathy Washington? 
Uh, but we all have cell phones. And so let me, paint, let me paint the picture for you here real quick. So you're on the phone, right? We all had this happen to us before. We're on the phone. We're on the phone with like a good friend or we're catching up. It might be a family member or somebody you haven't talked to for a while. And you're on the phone with them. Maybe you might be driving somewhere um, or you might just be chilling at home, whatever. And they're talking. You're catching up. It's a great conversation. You're having them like the belly laughs, right? Your tears and all that stuff. And then they get to a part of the conversation. They're like, hey, guess what? I forgot to tell you this. You ain't going to believe this, right? I got some tea for you. Guess what I heard? Or guess what happened to so-and-so, right? And now they got you all excited because they're about to tell you something. And then all of a sudden, they're like, and so the, check this out. You're never going to believe. And they, but they, and they what? And then they, and then she said, but then they were like, and you're like, I can't hear you. And then you guys go through this like tennis match of, of, can you hear me now? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can't hear you. And it's just back and forth. And you didn't get any of the story. You didn't get any of the communication. And then pretty soon the, the phone call drops. Right? We've all been there. Right? And the reason why the phone service drops is because one of us are in a dead spot. We're in a dead spot. And the reason why there's a dead spot and the call is dropping is because the signal from the phone has lost connection with the tower. There's been something obstructing the view from the signal to the tower. Therefore, the communication that you're trying to have with the person on the other side no longer exists. And you see, in our relationships, one of the most fundamental part of a relationship is communication. How we communicate with one another is the foundation for all relationships. If you look at when relationships go bad, think about the last bad relationship you had. How good was the communication in it? Think about any bad relationship that you've ever had in your life. What was the communication like? If I pull everybody in this room, ain't nobody going to say, oh, it was great communication. We just didn't work out. That's not how it works. The, the, the first thing that goes in bad relationships is communication. How we communicate with, other, with others is so important. How we communicate is so important. And so going back to my phone analogy, if, if there's something blocking the signal from the tower, the communication is poor. In the same sense, if there's something blocking us from our strong tower, from our ever-present help in a time of need. If the communication and the connection is poor between us and the Father, then how we communicate with those around us will suffer. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is the reason why we can't effectively communicate with those around us I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. We can't effectively communicate with those around us until we effectively communicate with who's above us. We can't effectively communicate with those around us until we first effectively communicate with who's above us. I see, I feel like sometimes it's difficult for us to communicate with those around us because there's an obstruction of the signal between us and the strong tower. It's like, I want to have a good communication relationship with my, with my wife, or I want to have a good communication with my friends. I want to have good communication with, with colleagues and coworkers, but there's, there's something causing a dead spot in my life with the connection with the father. There's something in my life right now that's causing there to be a dead spot where I'm having a disruption in the connection with my father, which is causing me to have bad communication with people around me. And so what do we do like that? So just like our cell phones, our spiritual lives can experience dead spots where we feel disconnected from God. These dead spots can be caused by various factors such as distractions, sin, lack of discipline, Lack of obedience, being around people you shouldn't be around, sticking around friends group you should have let go of, being in that relationship that God said go. 
not staying in a relationship where God said stay. There's so many distractions in our lives that cause us to have barriers and blocks that cause dead spots in our connection with our Father. And when we have dead spots with our connection with our Father, our lives can feel interrupted or entirely lost. Especially when we lose the, com- the ability to communicate like Jesus with those around us. So, so what's the answer, right? So we've identified the problem, right? Like if I want to communicate better in my relationships, if, I wanna, if, if I'm a husband here in this room right now and I'm thinking to myself, okay, yeah, I'm not that great at communicating with my wife. Why, Wes? What's, okay, I, I see that you said that there's some areas where maybe there's some dead spots in my life and, and that there's a, I'm, I'm putting barriers up between me and God right now and, and it's not allowing me to, to love and lead like Jesus in my household, which begins with the fundamental truth of just being a good communicator with my family. Hey, or, or you might be saying, Wes, you know what? My father never communicated. His father never communicated. His father's father never communicated. So why should I communicate? I don't know how to do it. They didn't do it. So why do I have to do it? I turned out fine. Did you? <laughs> you sure? I don't know. But that's the, that is the pattern of generational curse. Well, this is the way it's always been, so I'm going to continue to do it. But God's calling you to step above that. He's calling you to live above that. And this might be the moment right now where you realize, you identify, like, you know what? Yeah, I need to become a better communicator. It's okay to talk about how I feel. It's okay to talk about what's going on in my life. It's okay to say to somebody, hey, you hurt me. Some of us, that's our biggest problem in a room. We're afraid to say that somebody hurt us because we don't want to cause contention. We're, af- we're afraid of confrontation. So rather than say, you hurt me, we just get walked all over and then we get bitter our entire lives. We have to learn how to communicate in relationships. So how do we do it? How do we do it? The answer is simple, but not easy. And we'll find that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 18. So if you got your Bibles, boom, 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 open them up. You got your digital Bible. Go ahead. Get on your digital Bible. Hop on your phones. We live in a day and age where we have phones for Bibles. But I do like hearing the pages turn like that too. Chris, you let me know when you're ready. Take your time. Twelfth book in the New Testament. Perfect. All right. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 18. Now, we ask you, brothers and sisters, so let, let, me, let me back up. Let me, let me rephrase. Before we start saying this, I, I love to give context to what I'm about to read. So, so here, Paul, Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica, okay? And so this church is, is relatively new church. Like, it's, it's, it, was, it was established like two or three months before this letter was written. So a lot of the people in this church were, were, were kind of new or, let's just say, immature in their faith. Like, it's a very young and established church, but thriving, doing very well. Like, Paul's not saying, like, hey, you guys are bad. Like, he's, he's, he's encouraging them. He's equipping them. He wants to, he wants to help the church out. He's, and he, he's to help establish this church on his missionary journey. Now, you can imagine, if you help establish something, you want to see it grow, right? Like, you want to see it do well. You want to see it be successful. So that's the reason that he's writing to this church. He wants to help it out and see it grow. And he's getting reports back of all the things that's happening there. And he's helping them establish all these different things. And, and he's, he's, he sees that Christians are, are lacking understanding uh, about the return of Jesus. He's also seeing that they lack in maturity in their faith. And, and so he's writing to the church and of course, he's, he's, he's showing gratitude. Paul's really good at showing gratitude. He, all, he always opens his letters up saying, I just want to thank God for how great you guys are and how great everything is. And I think that's, if we're going to take anything away from today, like, we need to be more grateful, right? I mean, we're always quick to jump to complaining about something. Always griping, mumbling, groaning. Ah, oh, what if we just changed our groans to gratitude, Right? Like, what if we just changed, every time we wanted to groan about something, we just got grateful about something. I mean, that's the first thing we got to look at. It's like, we have to change our groans to gratitude. That wasn't even a part of the preach. That just came off the top. You're welcome. 
All right. Uh, so yeah, so he, has, he shows gratitude. He's, he's, he's um, exhorting or he's encouraging them, right? He's saying, hey, these are the things that you're doing good. Continue to do them, right? That's encouragement. You're doing a good job. Continue to do it. He's also saying he's giving them instructions on how to please God with their daily living. And he's, he's telling them how to love one another and, and what's required in that and, and how to be good citizens in a sinful world. I mean, we, can, we need that right now. I mean, this world is crazy right now. Right? So we should probably turn to Thess- Thessalonians right now and read that because it's, it's chaos amongst us. But he's instructing them how to be good sin- citizens in a sinful world. But we see in chapter 5, it's the final greetings in the first book of Thessalonians. And this is where he kind of wraps things up. He's instructing them how to live in peace and harmony with the leaders of the church or elders, but also how to communicate and stay connected with the Father. How to communicate and stay connected to the Father. And I think this is the biggest barrier in our lives. We overlook how we have to be connected to our Father. When we are connected to the strong tower, we will communicate better to those around us. So we have to connect better. So how do we do that? So the first part of this from 12 until 15, he's talking about how to, how to um, treat elders in a church, how to treat leaders in a church, and how we should hold them up in high regard, and how we should, should um, encourage this disheartened and help the weak and be patient with everyone and make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. That's a word for somebody today. Don't be paying back wrong for wrong. Stop it. Cut it out. It's not good. But paying back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and everyone else. And this is where what I want to focus in on. In verse 16, it says, Rejoice always. Pray continually. And give thanks in all circumstances. Say all circumstances. One more time. Come on, so the people down in the island can hear you. There we go. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. See, this is an instruction manual on how to stay connected to the Father. Because after each word, there's an adverb, right? Rejoice when? Always. Pray when? Continually. Give thanks when? All circumstances. And there's nothing about this that says stop. Sometimes. Only when you feel like it. When things are bad, only when things are good. Hey, when things aren't going so well, start it up. But when things get better, shut it down. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is how we fix the barrier that we have between us and the Father. This is how we fix it. So the first point I want to make on this comes from the rejoice always part. Rejoice always. What's it mean to rejoice? Why is it so important? I mean, we hear rejoice a lot, don't we? Right? Like Paul talked about it in Philippians. Rejoice. Uh, and uh, what's, what's he say? He says, rejoice and continue. I tell you to rejoice. Um, rejoice in the Lord always. And I say rejoice. Like rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Always rejoice. Like what is this? Rejoice. If you look at the dictionary word or definition for rejoice, uh, it doesn't really quite encaps- encapture what, what really the word rejoice means. See, if you look at the, the dictionary word for, or definition for rejoice, it's showing great joy or delight. I mean, does that really explain it? Like, showing great joy and delight. Like, I kind of got that from rejoice, right? Like, I, I get that, all right? You're not really defining it. But if you look at the, the, the definition of the Greek word for rejoice, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna spare you on trying to say it in Greek because that's not, I can barely speak English. Uh, <laughs> but it, it means favorably disposed to God's grace. Favorably disposed to God's grace. 
So what does that mean? Okay, you're telling me to rejoice, and now you're saying favorably disposed to God's grace. What does that mean? Well, think about where Paul was writing this letter from to the Philippian people when he wrote it. Where's he writing the letter from? Locked up. Ain't letting him out. Locked up, right? So you're telling me this man's in jail. Probably shouldn't be, because all he really was doing was preaching the gospel. Like doing what I'm doing right now, Butler police come in here and put me in jail. That's what he's doing. So he's locked up for preaching the gospel. And jail back in them times ain't jail today. <laughs> Let me tell you, ain't no AC. Ain't no hot in a cot. You might get a meal if you're lucky. There's probably a lot of abuse and torture going on. It's really sh- strenuous circumstances being in jail in those times especially if you're preaching the gospel. And here this man is telling people to, bless you, rejoice. Rejoice. How can he do that? It's because his circumstances around him is not what determined his joy within him. Let me say that again. His circumstances around him is not what determined the joy within him. Where did he get his joy from? His joy was in the fact that he has salvation. Come on. It doesn't matter how terminal the circumstances look because his eternity was secured. That's where his joy came from. So, yeah. I might be in jail, shackled up in prison, but guess what? This is temporary compared to my eternity. Hey, I might be in jail right now in pain and miserable, but guess what? This means nothing to the glory that's coming to me. Hey, I might be in jail right now, and this is awful, but this is nothing compared to the kingdom that's waiting for me. That's why he can say rejoice. Why? Because God saw favor upon him. In his grace sent his son to die for him so that he can have access to the father here and be with him in eternity on the other side of this life. That is joy. That's why we rejoice. That's why when things are bad, we can say, thank God, because this is temporary, but I know where my forever is at. That's joy. That's why he can be in prison and say, rejoice, pause, rejoice again. When things get difficult, guess what? Rejoice always. The second part of this, he says, pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Pray continually. If I want to have better communication in my relationships I need to not only rejoice always, but I need to pray continually. Some of us might have a wrong understanding of prayer. What is prayer? We say it all the time as church folk, I'm going to pray for you. After I realize uh, I'm going to pray for you can be like the, the northern way of saying bless your heart. Right? Like, really? You really going to pray for me? Or are you just saying that because you, you being, you know, being smart? Mm-hmm. I bless your heart. Um, but what is prayer? You know? We talk about it. We say it. Hey, some of us even do it. But do we truly understand what we're doing in the moment of prayer? I know when I first came to Christ, I'm like, I ain't want to pray out loud. I ain't want to pray in a circle. I got anxiety. If someone said, hey, can you pray for dinner? I'm like, mm. I'll say something. I'll put some on it. But I really don't want to pray, you know? I might say something wrong, right? Everyone ever feel that way? Like, I don't want, I don't want to pray out loud because I don't want to say something wrong, right? I want to get it right. I want to pray good, right? I want to be a good prayer, So I'm going to wait to get good at praying before I pray. Excuse me? (laughs) How are you 
going to get good at it if you don't do it. What is prayer? Well, prayer is a communication between man and God. The most powerful prayer I ever said in my life was, God help me. You know why it was the most powerful prayer? Because it was the most sincere I've ever been to God up to that moment. I remember being on my knees in my bedroom, strung out, kind of coming off of a three, four day bender at the end of my ropes. You know, suicide was not really a thought, but like I didn't really care to live, you know? Maybe it was like pre suicide, I don't know. Alone, in despair, depression, just a mess. But I knew there was more. You know, I knew there was more, but I also knew that I wasn't enough. I knew I needed more. And in my desperation, God help me. I'm done. I don't know what to do anymore. I've tried everything and I've failed. I don't, it's, I didn't, I wasn't quoting scripture. I wasn't, I wasn't interpreting the word. I wasn't speaking, speaking Hebrew and Greek. I was just being honest with what I needed. I was being honest with my father. God help, help me. I'm on my knees. I don't know what else to do. I tried everything else. My life's a wreck. God help. The most powerful prayer I ever said. It's not about the words, people. It's about the heart. That's what God wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your heart. Do you need me? Because if you need me, guess what? I'm here for you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm your father. There's nothing more I love. There's nothing more I love to see Eli pop up on my cell phone. A father always loves to hear from their, from their child. Always. I don't care how dumb it is. You can, he, Eli could call me with the dumbest thing in the world. Dad, guess what happened today? Banana butt. What? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not the fact of what he said. It's simply the fact that he called me. He called me. And when you call on the Lord, he will answer you. He will answer you. If he did it in my life, come on, I'm no special. I'm not special. He will do it in your life. Psalms 91, 14 says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him and acknowledge my name. For he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. He will call on me and I will answer him. That's That's his promise. His promise is to answer you. The problem when it comes to prayer, sometimes we don't like the answer. Sometimes we don't like to wait for the answer. I mean, what would a con if 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 conver if a conver if prayer is a conversation with God, what would a conversation look like if I being this, per- like I'm this person, you're that person, and I'm coming to you saying, hey, I need this, that, this, that, this, that, all right, cool, bye. And that's the end of the conversation. Conversation's two ways. It's back and forth. There's two parties involved. But sometimes we approach God as if he's this magical vending machine and we're hitting AC and, and, and B7 and, and G19 and I need a little bit of, of C13 too. All right, now give it to me. And God's like, if I gave you all that, you couldn't even handle it. You'd spoil it in a week. Praying not only involves talking to God, praying involves listening to God, hearing from God, going to the secret and quiet places of your life 
getting into your prayer closets, going to your prayer basements, hey, putting down the phones and social media and putting down the chaos around you. So you, I can't hear from God. I can't hear from God. How noisy is your life? You can't hear from God because you've got all this noise around you. You want to hear God through the noise, and God's like, no, I need you to come up to the mountain and step away from the noise so you can hear me clearly. You need to hear from him. You need to talk to him. You need to hear from him. That is prayer. Not only hearing from him, waiting for him, responding to him. Don't just be listeners of the word. Be, James says be doers of the word. Apply it to your life. You get an answer from God. You're like, God, that's not how I thought it was going to go. Try again. Let me shake the eight ball again. I need a different answer. You're trying to put God into your will. You're supposed to put you into God's will. That's not how it works. Last thing. I can go forever on prayer. Sorry. Let me, go, let me move forward. Last thing. Uh, in all circumstances, give thanks. This one hurts. This one hurts. This one hurt me as I was preparing for it, because I'm like, I start thinking of some circumstances. I know your circumstances. I talk to some of you. I hear from some of you. I get prayer requests from some of you. And I've heard some circumstances in this church. And I know it's hard. Because it says in all circumstances, not the good ones, the bad ones too. And we got some bad circumstances in our lives don't we? We have some tough circumstances. I'm not talking current circumstances. Maybe your life's okay now. Maybe, you know, you did the work, you put the effort in, and life's kind of looking good now. But boy, get triggered. Let something happen that triggers you about your past, childhood, the abuse, the neglect, The abandonment, the addictions, it's hard to give thanks. How do you want me to give thanks, Wes? How, what? Give thanks? Do you understand how hard my life was? And you want me to give thanks in all circumstances? No, 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 no. I don't think you realize. How about I forget some circumstances and in other circumstances I'll give, I'll give thanks for? It. How about you? How about I forget the hand I was dealt and the pain and the suffering that I went through and, and the, all the good stuff I will remember? How about I forget all the stuff that kept me up late at night, making me crying and making my parents cry and making me worry and making me frustrated? How about I forget all that? Because that's what's easy to do. Come on, we're taught to forget things. Come on, in a society we live in today where we have everything at our fingertips to make us feel good, we never want to feel bad. Mm. Thank you, Lord. How can I give thanks when I was abandoned and abused? How can I give thanks? I had to bury my own child. You want me to give thanks? How can I give thanks? My family's plagued with addiction. Mom's, mom's a crackhead. Dad's hustling. He sells her crack. How can I give thanks for that? I got a terminal diagnosis. Never smoked a cigarette in my life, but I got lung cancer. How do you want me to give thanks?
James talks about how we needed to consider it a joy when we face trials of many kinds. And I always thought that was interesting. Like, how can I consider it a joy for what I'm going through in the trials of my life? How can I? I mean, that's essentially what this is saying is give thanks in all circumstances. And James says, uh, uh, consider it a great joy when you face trials of many kinds. So how do I do all this? What it all comes back down to is Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, come on, all, I need you all to say it. We know in all things. Come on, you've heard it, you've said it, but do you believe it? Come on, time out. I'm about to start kicking stuff over. You've heard it. You've said it, you've quoted it, you've seen it on people's Facebook posts, but do you believe it? Do you really believe that God can use the abuse for that, he, that happened to you in your life? Come on, the people who are supposed to love you hurt you. You think God can use that? You think God can use the fact that you had to bury your own child? Your child was taken from you, robbed from you because of addiction or or, or violence or chaos in this world. You think God can use that? Because don't get, listen, I might be stepping on some toes. This might hurt right now, but this is the truth. Like we think this, we think this is just make to make us feel good. And sometimes we use the Bible like a, like it's a bottle of Tylenol. We just wanted to get rid of the pain that we're going through right now and move on with life. But really what this is, this is truth. If this says that it can use all things, that God works all things for good for those who love him, who have been called according to their purpose, that means everything that's ever happened to you that you thought was bad, God can use for good. Come on. What the enemy meant for evil in your life, God's turning it to good. What he meant for bad in your life, God's turning it for good. How? Well, maybe there's a day that you're going to come across somebody who's going through abuse in their life. And they want to give up. Come on, there might be somebody at a coffee shop who's contemplating this is the it. I can't take it anymore. What's the hope? What's the use? The people who are supposed to love me hurt me. There's no one around. Everyone's abandoned me. I might as well give up. And you walk into their life. And you say, hey, I've been there. Hey, it's going to be okay. I know this hurts right now. And I know you're struggling. And I know it might seem like there's no point of going on anymore and and life is really difficult. And let me tell you, I've been there. But I was there. But now I'm not anymore. And the only way I made it out was through the love of Jesus. Revelation 12 talks about how enemies are defeated by the shedding of the blood and the sharing of our testimony. It's in our testimony where the bad things turn to the good things. Come on. It's our testimonies that say, this is how bad life used to be, but this is how good God is. Come on, I was down and out. I was defeated. I was addicted. But now I'm up, standing upright, proud, happy. I got a story to tell. My story's going to help save lives. Come on, that's when God turns the bad to good. He creates a story. He turns the impossible to possible in your lives. And now you have a story to tell. And stories change lives. Testimonies will help change lives. Why? Not because anything you did, only by what he did. I tried everything to get away from drugs. Jesus was the only way. 
period, point blank. Come on, if we want to get better at communicating with those around us, we gotta remove the barriers that stand between us and our Father. We gotta get connected to Him. How do we get connected to God? How do we stay connected to God? Pray continually. Yes, ma'am. Someone's been paying attention. Gold star for her today. Rejoice when? Always. Come on, give thanks in every circumstance. Why does James talks about how we, we give, um, we consider it a great joy when we fear trials of many kind. Why? Because it gives our faith an opportunity to mature, to grow. And what's the end of that? We'll be lacking nothing needing nothing. So when you face a trial, give thanks because God, you know what? My faith is going to grow in this moment. It's tough right now, but God, you're tougher. God, God, this is hard right now, but God, I know you're stronger. Come on, if we want good, strong relationships in our lives, have to rejoice always. Continue to pray. Never stop praying. Finally, give thanks in all, in all circumstances. Stay connected to God. When we connect to Him, we can become connected around us. He is the missing link in our lives. So, let me just pray. Father God, I just thank you. Today. I thank you for the word that you put in our heart today. I thank you for delivering that word today. Holy Spirit, we thank you for showing up today. We know that it's not, transformation doesn't come from being up here and screaming and going crazy. Transformation comes from your spirit, conviction. Thank you that you care enough about us. That conviction is something that brings us back to the Father. And thank you for your grace and your mercies new every day. The Lord knows I need them every day, that's for sure. Because I'm not perfect. You are. That's what makes us so good together. God, for every pain that's in this room right now, God, I pray, I speak healing into it. God, I know we talked about some tough things today. It might have opened up some wounds. God, I pray that you heal those wounds. You bring supernatural healing to those wounds today. Your word says that you are near the brokenhearted. Father, just any broken hearts in there today, Father, I pray that you just be near them, heal them, give them a peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, I pray that you just lift us up today, help us to stay connected to you so we can communicate better to those who are around us in our lives. Father, thank you for giving us eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, I pray for boldness in this room today. Boldness to face the battles, not by themselves, but coming humbly and boldly before the throne and asking and inviting you into the battle with them because you go before us. So, Father, we thank you for victory. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before our usher teams come forward to receive our tithes and offerings and response cards, here's a few important things happening with our CE family. Do you love being around people and making others feel right at home? If so, our frontline ministry may be a great opportunity for you to make a big difference. You can still attend this worship service as most of our frontline ministry occurs before or after the Sunday services. There are opportunities to be a greeter, usher, help in the parking lot, or serve on the safety team, just to name a few of the many options available. To find out more, write frontline on your response card and drop it in the offering bucket as it passes by. As our ushers come forward to collect our response cards and receive our tithes and offerings, Thank you for being a joyful, generous church. We freely give much because Jesus has given us so much. Our response to his grace is a life of abundant generosity. 
our faithfulness and giving allows our CE family and guests to be served well and helps more people experience a full life in Jesus. You can give in the offering buckets each Sunday, set up reoccurring giving on our CE website or CE app, or by sending a check in the mail. Every gift makes a difference. Thank you for being a generous church family. Thank you so much for being on mission with us to help more people experience full life in Jesus Christ. I love today's impacting service. You may have personally made a commitment during the service. If you did, please reach out to us. Also, if you have questions or comments or prayer requests, go to churchexperience.tv backslash connect or scan the QR code on the screen. I personally love to stay connected by staying up to date on the CE social media, Instagram, Facebook, our website, or even the app. It's been great to share another special service with our CE family, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great week.